some amazing folks uh, from the Texas area here today to talk to us about using online tools to really grow their offline community. And there's all these social network tools and this and that, but it feels so disconnected and not social these days. So they've got some really great experience about growing real people, getting them together in real life to do things together and actually meet up and have some fun and um, be there for their brand. So I am going to get out of the way now and introduce these folks and let them kind of take it over. Um, on the end down there, on the far end, we have Beth Belanti Walker, and she is creative and soul wrangler for Tito's Handmade Vodka. Um, coming up next, uh, we have Brock Wagner, who is the brewer slash founder at St. Arnold Brewery. And we have Lenny Ambrose, the events and marketing for St. Arnold uh, Brewery. So that's, that's your panel, guys. Let's hear it for them. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is um, let these folks talk a little bit about the early days and kind of how they got, how the business got started, how they got into it, and who they are and all that kind of stuff. Here you go. Hi. Uh, the story of, of Tito and Tito's Handmade Vodka started 15, well, more than 15 years ago. He's actually sold his first case about 15 years ago, and his version of the story would take 45 minutes or more, so I don't really, it's hard to condense it because he's uh, kind of an adventure guy and had a crazy life before he even started Tito's. And he's a geologist, geophysicist, uh, who had a lot of kind of failed businesses and plans and uh, was flavoring other people's vodka as hobbies uh, for Christmas presents and whatnot. And people kept calling him vodka guy, and he kept saying, I'm not vodka guy, I'm mortgage guy, I'm scientist guy. And they're like, no, we think you're vodka guy. So he he's pretty much just looked up all the code and saw that um, Texas had never had a legal distillery, and he wondered why. And so it took him a few years to get the permit and, and prove it and... Uh, and then he started going. He just built this little shack and a pot still from uh, reading books on prohibition, and uh, was there. Yeah, he was there for a long for a long time by himself, doing everything. And then he had a, you know a guy kind of helping bottle. Which when I started, we were still putting the uh, labels on with Elmer's glue and screwing the caps on with a power tool. Uh, so uh, he, you know, the first year I was there um, was nine years ago and I worked for free for a year because I just had a feeling about him. I left corporate America and and thought the world was ready for a real guy who, who wasn't in it just for the money and to be famous and to flip a brand. He was in it because he loved doing it and he had endured so much getting it started. So uh, now uh, it's been the fastest growing spirit in America uh, for several years. It's in all 50 states in Canada and it's still, you know, a small company, and uh, I just still think it's a startup. You know, we have a long way to go, but we're kind of in it for the journey, and not for the gratification of of selling it. Or you know, we're just kind of interested in seeing what happens. We surely didn't believe this would. So, uh, well, <coughs> I'm used to speaking without a microphone, so. Projecting into the microphone might be a little scary here. Um, so I started off as a home brewer in college. Uh, the RA in my dorm at Rice taught me how to home brew. It, it wasn't part of the curriculum. Um, the university didn't like the fact that I ran a bar out of my dorm room either, but that's all right. I still graduated. Um, after I always knew I wanted to have my own company, was kind of entrepreneurially minded starting in high school. Um, kept, and they were kind of focused often on, you'd almost call them get rich quick kind of schemes because I thought money was a real motivator. After college, I went into investment banking, of course, since I just said that, and uh, sold my soul. Was an investment banker for six years, did mergers and acquisitions, learned a huge amount about business, how businesses run. Financial plan. You know, I can build a, a model of a company and putting two companies together in my sleep. Um, but it was during this period that I realized that money was not my motivator. I had actually contemplated opening a brewery right after college, but ran the numbers and went, oh, can't get filthy rich doing this. <clears throat> after six years having a boss who was an idiot, after telling my boss that he was an idiot, 
decided this would be an awesome time to open that brewery. I actually first ran the numbers, but this time with, from a very different perspective, okay, I can keep a roof over my head and food on the table, and that was really what I was after. And so opened St. Arnold's in, in 1994. Uh, you know, we, the craft brewing was taking off around the country. Already on the West Coast, North Pacific Northwest, the breweries were just, you know, selling everything they could make. We opened in, in I, I picked Houston because one, I lived here and I really loved Houston. And secondly, it was the largest city in the country that didn't have a craft brewery, so it seemed like a no-brainer. Opened the brewery, discovered there were 37 craft beer drinkers in the city of Houston. <coughs> um, knew them all personally. And for about the first seven years, uh, the average age of our customer got about one year older every year. Uh, around 2001, we, 2001, 2002, really started to see a big shift in, in people's perception of beer here. And our average age of our customer, instead of being now in their mid to late 30s, we actually started seeing people in their late 20s, mid 20s, then started seeing people 21 coming in and drinking our beer. And uh, yeah, we realized that there is this shift in perception, you know, the, the generational shift occurring where 21-year-olds uh, had grown up with craft beer their whole life, and their view of beer was this huge spectrum of flavor, not just Bud Miller Coors. So uh, we've been growing pretty rapidly, really, since about 2001. Um, move, We've been brewing now for a year and a half at our new location, which has air conditioning and better bathrooms. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but we continue to focus very much our, mark, our growth and how we sell our beer as a marketing and event-based company, which is why a few years ago, after uh, Lenny here, kept coming on our tour, kept bugging me for a job. Um, finally, what really did it was I was at the Great American Beer Festival, and he was running around the festival floor with koozies with his name and phone number on them, handing them out to other breweries. It's like, okay, we don't really have, have a job for him yet, but we'll hire him, and I'm sure he'll be able to make it. So... Uh, he went from having very little to do to, I think he has a little bit more to do now, so I'll pass the, the mic to him now. What Brock said. Uh, <clears throat> I was a, a local TV sportscaster for 12 years and uh, decided to, to get out of that uh, after I got married and high-fived my wife in the hallway. That was a <laughs> big thing because she would work during the day. I worked at night, so we never saw each other. So um, I had gone on a, a bunch of St. Arnold events and uh, decided that's where I wanted to work and emailed Brock from the TV station's computer. I don't know if that's good or not. Uh, <clears throat> to say that he should just hire me. <laughs> hey, you that don't know me, you should hire me. And I got a... Uh, I uh, email back. W one of the things that kind of sold me that why I wanted to, to try to work there was just reading the bios that were written on the web page, and I thought it was sort of the way I wrote my sportscasts. So I'm like, wow, that would be a good idea. So I did that, and then the thing with the koozies, and, and here we are today. Derek? Improvisation. So, um, okay, so we've talked, I know we talked a little bit before this about how similar the companies are and how you guys just mentioned that started small and have grown to be this, what seems like crazy big kind of company with these fans that are so passionate. Um, and I think you both had about 35 employees is what you said. So very cool to see how 35 people can grow from your beginnings to what you do now. And then especially with that, the growth of your online efforts, so I was going to see if maybe you could share uh, a little bit about how you started using online technology um, in the beginning. Was it easy? Was it hard? And kind of how that's changed as your company's grown uh, as well. Well, when I first started, I had to fight uh, for Tito to get a website because he had some 
thing. I don't even know how to describe it, but there was like electronic music in the background and like a scroll of one line going across, you know, and they were like, what? get out of here with your technology, you know. I was like, no, really, I, I think you deserve better and you've got a great story and that would be a way to tell it, you know, online um, when you can't be there. And uh, eventually I won. It then took me like several years to get like a, a merch for people to get our T-shirts. That was another huge battle. Um, but once we, you know, once we had it and made it easy for people to write in, we started getting more love letters. And to this day, we get them all day, obviously all night when people have been drinking. <laughs> and they go to me. I have really good stories if you want to talk about it later. Uh, so, you know, the Tito's fans are like this army of people who are, who feel so much passion over this vodka because it's, um, affordable, but scores and wins all these big world awards. And Tito himself is just an amazing guy and super, uh, handsome and, uh, <laughs> Very funny and charming, and so uh, and it's kind of an underdog. I mean, he's he never got investors. He put the whole thing on credit cards and really risked it all and went to the very bottom you can go before something kind of caught. Uh, so people hear the story, and I think it's it's mostly about the vodka and loving it, and maybe not feeling as bad in the morning after <laughs> drinking uh, a lot of drinks with it. Uh, but I think it's that he's really inspired people, and so it's like the vodka is kind of a symbol for something bigger. And everyone wants to support him because he's gone up against these monster corporations with all these liquors. So people really want to talk to us about it. And we want to talk to them. And to this day, I don't allow, uh, well, that's another story. Um, when I was brand manager, I never allowed anyone to do automated responses. And now that I consult and just do the creative, the new brand manager is the same way. We agree on everything. And uh, so I would say, you know, we've gone from real simple things to having to cater to 50 states, like all the consumers, the media, the distributors, and the industry people all in one place. And we do everything in-house, uh, which no one believes, but it's true. We just are still in startup mode, so we all work all the time. But we just, we keep it in-house, you know, and we, I'm so glad Tito didn't get investors because our product never got diluted. Um, and definitely this brand was like built on word of mouth. So when MySpace happened, I was like, oh my God, now I can do word of mouth for real in real time with all of these people that have been writing in that I know are out there. And we sure caught up, we caught up with them real fast. And then one day I get an invitation to join Twitter and I'm like, great, another thing. Everyone's trying this stuff. But um, I, I signed on as myself and watched it grow. It was like right as it came out when there was nobody there. And as I watched it grow, I thought, this is safe. You know, like we, this is going to be something. And I, I made a Tito's handle and empowered the other employees to get their own Tito's handle. And as long as they followed kind of a manifesto of, of our value system when communicating. Um, so it really has helped with word of mouth marketing. You know, it was free. It's in real time. We're human beings. Tito's real. You know, our everyday life is kind of hilarious most of the time. And it's a way to show kind of the lifestyle and the appreciation. And um, I believe in saying thank you eight times before you ever ask for anything. So it's a great way to just keep saying thank you. So that's how it's changed. When we started in 94, uh, that was right about the time email really kind of was transitioning from being just a tool that companies use to talk amongst themselves, people, you know, employees talk amongst themselves to people actually getting their own email addresses for at home to talk to friends. And, you know, we, I don't know how much was skill and how much was luck, but we'll just call it skill. <laughs> um, we got on that right away and immediately started building email lists. And whenever anybody came out to the brewery, visited, We'd get their email address. We went out, we did promotions, we carried clipboards around, we got people's email addresses, which was also a great conversation starter, especially since, ironically, I'm an introvert and it gave me a way to start talking to people. Um, the, uh, we built that up, and you know, another super big thing back then was people would try to buy email lists and we absolutely would not ever give out our email list to anybody for any reason. Um, 
and from that we would use we we started having a newsletter and we'd let people know about events and what was going on what beers were coming out i re always wrote the newsletters i still write the newsletters and the, something that's very interesting is when we started email newsletters were conversations and it was a way to have a conversation with our customer and when we had 2,000 people on our email list fairly early on, which was seen as just this huge number, I think we're at 30,000 now, um, we'd send out 2,000 newsletters and I'd probably get 25 to 50 people emailing me back with questions and talking. It was just very conversational. Um, it built loyalty with our customers. If, even when we didn't grow as fast as a lot of breweries in other parts of the country were growing, we, the customers we did have had this real connection to us. And when we had missteps, you know, we would always quickly communicate those and, and people would also let us know. <laughs> but it, it gave us an ability to talk to people and it was wonderful. Um, we've kept doing that. Uh, if you email brewery at starnold.com, I'm actually the person who responds. I, don't do it every day, but it's probably, I hit that three times a week, sometimes more, um, because I like to know what people are saying, and it's not such a huge workload that I can't handle it. Um, and I think it's just important to have that you know, very human touch, kind of like what Beth was saying. Um, something, we still use the newsletter. It is still an incredibly effective tool for getting information to our customers, and our customers love it. The big difference is it is no longer a conversation. It is a one-way flow of information in people's minds now because I think everybody gets so many of these things that you know when we had 2,000 people, I'd get 25 to 50 responses. Now we have 30,000, and maybe I'll get one or two. And I think the conversation has really all moved to Facebook and Twitter. And I will pass the mic because if you get Facebook or Twitter, conversations from us, that's actually Lenny. And I always know when Brock checks that brewery at starnold.com because I instantly have about 30 forwards from him for things I need to take care of. So I always, I always appreciate the, the, when he checks that. Um, <clears throat> when I, I started uh, February, I'm sorry, January 2nd, 2007, and uh, one of the first questions I asked was if the brewery had a MySpace page. And so uh, didn't, nobody had even really thought about it. And so uh, I decided oh, I'll start one and see, and it, it kind of took off, and MySpace obviously did its thing, but it, we never really had the, the impact with it or the conversation back and forth, because as everybody knows, it devolved into, come see our band play or get $50 free at whatever. So uh, it died a, a pretty bad death. Um, <clears throat> and then I heard about Twitter through actually Monica Dana. I saw her in here somewhere. She wasn't even here to get her pat on the back. Wow. Um, but we, we started our Twitter account really right before everybody had one almost to where I, I didn't really know what it was exactly, but we had to explain in the newsletter, go like point by point, what this thing is that you're going to sign up for. Um, <clears throat> and we really focused on that a while and then also started focusing on Facebook more. And it's kind of the evolution of it now is the Twitter people are very loyal. The Facebook people give us way more interaction. Um, and uh, that has been the the biggest social media tool for us. Twitter is great, and we do a lot with that still. But you know, uh, when grannies are on Facebook and they like our you know like our beer, then they also participate. And it's just not the same with Twitter. Um, so, it, it, like Brock said, that has been the conversation, both good and bad, in a lot of ways, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Great, thanks. Um, and so we are going to actually talk a little bit about some of the challenges. Um, you guys both face some pretty unique challenges with the industry that you're in. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about it, but I think there's a lot of similarities that people can take from it as well. The alcohol industry has some 
unique things, but oil and gas maybe has something, or certain nonprofits, or the medical industry. We've talked to a lot of people, and they say, we, we, we can't be on Facebook. We're a public company. Well, you probably can. So, But what are some of the challenges that go along with that? Do you have any, I know Beth mentioned some internal kind of guidelines that mm -hmm. you guys use to use those tools. Right. Well, from within the company, we have guidelines as far as how we conduct ourselves and the fact that we represent a real human being that we love, adore, respect, who has three small children, and that you know we don't make Tito's for people to go crazy and um, you know have have insane parties or over drink or get sick. You know we we want people to really savor it and be responsible. Um, we feel very protective over that and over Tito. So um, we kind of regulate it from within on on what's important to us. Um, language wise and who we are and you know if someone can't um, do that and you know I understand once in a while we all have too much to drink and and maybe a tweet or two gets out there but for the most part uh, if somebody you know I just say keep it you know anonymous or or you know it's up to you if you want to be Tito's so-and-so then you got to toe the line and read this and do it um, I would say overall we have to be careful because of age. You know, we have to find a way to verify. Um, you know, we don't retweet things that make people seem like they're in you know dangerous, crazy situations, like a place being too crowded or someone is drinking too much. That's not fun or cool to us. You know, like we we love people, we worry about them. We don't encourage any kind of stuff like that. Uh, I would say also um, because of the laws in Texas. Beer and liquor laws are actually different, but then we're in Texas, which is its own planet. Yeah. So, uh, so we can't, you know, we we can't really show favoritism to accounts. We could retweet what they say, but we can't just go. My favorite bar is, you know, uh, we just say thank you, you know, without naming names, or we retweet things that are going on unless it's charity or nonprofit, which we give away probably half of our vodka to communities to help grow them and as a way to saying thank you really I mean we started as a way to say thank you to Austin for supporting us but now it's like Tito's heart is like that kind of giving heart you know we all kind of have our own pet nonprofit type things we're into and he lets us just run with those so um, we have regulations and we kind of watch each other and police each other a little bit and it's not for everybody a lot of people just opt out not to be part of it and we keep the main you know, handles only handled by one or two people that represent Tito's. Everyone else that's kind of connected, you know, has to do their thing too. But we keep it very strict as far as, you know, not anybody at Tito's can get on and tweet from the Tito's account. It's very uh, regulated that way. Yep, yeah, I think we have a very similar philosophy. And it's funny, I guess it, maybe it's just so ingrained in kind of our culture that it never even comes up to, you know, do anything that would encourage sort of over imbibing or illustrate that we have. I'm not saying we never have, but uh, the, uh, the you know the big the big challenge for us is really the TABC laws. When you think about guerrilla marketing and the types of things that you know, if you're a brewery opening up that you want to do, chances are they're illegal in Texas. Um, Go next door to Louisiana, nah, <laughs> anything goes. Um, but uh, so we have to be really careful and creative on how we do things. Um, I, I think the best illustration is how we do our pub crawls. And it's kind of evolved a little bit over the years as the laws have changed slightly. Um, oddly, in, in, the, in the state of Texas, again, it is a different planet. In the world of brewers, everything we love to drink is beer. And there's, there's ales and lagers, and that's based on what type of yeast we use. But in the state of Texas, there's ale and beer. And beer is below 5% alcohol. Ale is above 5% alcohol. It, this is the only state in the world, place in the world that defines it that way. And because of that, you can't buy a lot of beers in Texas because they've got the wrong label and nobody wants to relabel for one state. Actually, a lot of people do relabel for one state. But um, the, uh, 
especially starting off, we weren't allowed to pre-announce or pre-arrange a promotion. <laughs> Obviously, that's an issue. I asked the TABC once, is it illegal for me to make dinner reservations? And they said, well, yeah, technically, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, <coughs> we, so what we would do, and I actually cleared this with the TABC, we were allowed to announce that we were going to have a promotion somewhere in the general vicinity of the corner of Morningside and Green and uh, University on the east side of the street, about 100 feet north. Um, and so we would actually have these pub crawls and other events where we would just announce sort of general directions. And people loved this because it became something of a scavenger hunt for them. And they, they'd all email to each other, oh, hey, I figured out all, what all of them are and stuff. And it really hasn't been a hindrance. In fact, I think it's kind of created a little bit of a special cachet. Now, if we're doing it as an ale event, we can actually list the specific places. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, just depending. Um, sometimes it, there's might be too much confusion if we don't list exactly what they are. Um, but it's a real challenge for us to, and we're constantly working to abide by the Texas laws. And the, one of the biggest challenges is they're written very loosely. And if you talk to them, intentionally so. So you're already, always operating in the gray area. So we try to be as light of gray as possible. Um, try not to go too dark, but you have to really watch yourself, so. Um, I, I think w one of the, the biggest challenges is, um, and, and first of all, let me preface it by saying, I, we realize, and I'm sure Beth does as well, that we probably have one of the best and most perfect um, companies for social media because people want to find out about the stuff. I've always wondered about uh, whatever, Joe's laundry mat that says follow us on Facebook. Why? I don't <laughs> Free coin at the laundry mat today or something? Like, why would I want to do that? Uh, so we, we are involved in companies that have fun events and have fun things to drink, so it just happens to work perfectly with social media. But uh, you really have to take um, the good with the bad, and I think uh, for both companies, we probably built up a enough goodwill that if someone goes on our Facebook page and prints, you know, I hate you because of X, <laughs> because I didn't get the special release beer, or I couldn't find it. You didn't make enough, um, which happens. I don't go on there and delete that. Um, I usually try to say something very nice. Sorry, we'll try to do better the next time. A pretty short uh, reply. And then I let um, the customers defend us. Uh, which they do. Uh, it, it, it's really amazing. You know, a lot of, oh, shut up and go have a beer, <laughs> chill out. <laughs> Things that I could never say personally to them, um, but the customers are usually more than willing to help us out in that regard. Um, but you just have to be as nice as possible uh, when responding to them. Um, and I think it would just look bad if you took down all of the and, and we don't get a lot, honestly, but whatever bad comments there are. Um, and most people do it constructively, but some people, uh, and then that's the other thing. Once everybody jumps on them or we just respond nicely, then they'll usually leave a comment backing down from that. Well, okay, I, I understand. Um, so I think that that helps build up goodwill as well to, to respond in that manner. Cool. Um, and so that's a little bit about the challenges of it. So it makes it sound super scary. Don't do this stuff. But it is a really powerful thing. And from our talks, one of the things that Beth said is that she really believes in the power of doing it right. I'm quoting you. <laughs> so um, I was going to see if you guys could talk a little bit about the real benefit that comes from this. You mentioned a little bit of people standing up for you and that kind of thing. But um, a little bit scary to get into, maybe. But once you get in, the real power behind it, some some good examples of how you guys have seen that um, with your companies? Well, I'll say a lot of people 
took a chance on Tito's or discovered it and then told friends and they feel this very intense ownership over the brand for that reason. And that's something they really want us to know all the time. And I feel like, you know, we need to always take care of them too and not forget kind of who, you know, dance with who brung you, Tito says. So um, some things that have worked are like we we developed a thing called Tito's Tasters, which was kind of an email list and we sent out quarterly challenges or gifts or a message from Tito or a video on how to do something. We, you know, try to get them the information first or only to them as a way to reward them for being so loyal. And it also kind of reopens if they've ever had something they wanted to ask us. It kind of reminds them they can email us to ask us something. Um, so that has really worked great. And one of the kind of, that's sort of what I was thinking about with the title of the panel was how to bring your online communities offline kind of successfully. And we used, you know, these people, you know, on our lists and on Twitter and Facebook. And then, you know, we, sometimes we even treat them differently and have different events for those different groups. Cause I feel like they are kind of different. Like I don't use my Twitter updates for my Facebook, you know, Facebook is like the, you know, where everyone participates and I feel like it's super visual. Whereas Twitter, I almost use as a customer service tool to answer things very quickly and say thank you very quickly and get news out and that kind of thing. It's like the conversation, you know, it's like the ADD, you know, one-sided conversation real quick and it's over and we're on to the next thing. Um, so we took like our email list of the tasters and uh, and emailed them that Tito was going to be in their city. And then after he did all the stuff he has to do during the day, he'd meet them all out for a party at a bar or, you know, for a band or something. And people just loved, like, waiting for those updates of where he was going to pop up. And, you know, they can go and meet him and shake his hand and say everything they wanted to say to him. We'd always, you know, make some kind of cool swag to ship out there, you know. So we kind of treat people kind of specifically in their groups and, you know, as to what the vibe is in that group or – um, so it's just been, it, if you do it right and you do it responsibly and it's like you treat people like everyone wants attention and validation for the things they love and are passionate about, you kind of just have to appeal to that kind of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and lucky for us, we have a boss who looks everyone in the eye and talks to everyone, you know, for way too long, probably, <laughs> and stays up really late. Uh, so it's worked out really beautifully for us to be able to find ways to bring him to his people, bring his story to the people. He's very accessible. We're very accessible. So I love all this online stuff, but I'm like a nature girl. You know, I'd rather be on a horse half the time. So I like that, you know, human element where we're all communicating all day on our devices, but let's get together, you know, let's slap a name tag on, you know, or have a way to mix the crowd up and meet each other at something. I just love that sort of taking it you know I just don't think it stops online you know I think like life is short and we should be together that's my hippie Austin side for you peace <laughs> I better watch what I'm saying Morgan's out already tweeting stuff um, I, I have two quick things one is sort of actually continuing on what uh, Lenny was talking about a second ago and I think this is one of those big sort of successes you can have which is when something goes wrong, depending how you approach it, to me, you can win more points turning by taking a negative and turning it into a positive. It's really a great opportunity. If you handle it right, you can win somebody forever instead of having a, a negative out there. And that'll be one of the most energized, you know, positive customers you'll have. And so no matter how rude or terrible or annoying somebody is in a situation, I always say, yeah, you know, they may be a jerk, but they are a jerk. Actually, I use a different word, but <laughs> um, and if you know, come come and shout about them to me. Don't shout about them to them. No matter how gratifying that may feel right at that moment, but in the end, you can really win somebody over by just staying positive and and trying to to say and saying sorry and how can we make it better. But um, I think one of the coolest things that I've seen happen was, uh, as a success on social media has been our Divine Reserves. Um, they're this special release series of beers. They come out. Uh, we hoped that they would sell quickly. And by sell quickly, we thought we meant sell out in two weeks, not 
two hours. Um, and actually, they don't usually last two hours. Uh, it's the craziest thing you've ever seen in your life. But we, the only way we let people know about when it's coming out and what the beer is going to be is on our newsletter and social media. And uh, you know, the, when you get the bottle, it'll just have a batch number at the top. So you don't even know what's in there unless you're on our social media. And people will be lined up around the block at Specs at 7 in the morning. They open at 10, for those of you who... Well, I know everybody, you probably know that to get your, your morning fix. But, um, <laughs> and there were really, really cool things that started to happen, and Lenny really encouraged this, was to have people put, put the, you know, D, if it's DR9 or DR11, whatever it is, tweet where you find it and put the hashtag on there. And, I mean, we just light up the you know, the twit face universe with people running around on these quests for the beer and telling about their successes and their failures. And it just takes on a life of its own. And it's, it's something to behold. We just kind of sit back and watch. Well, except for James, who gets lots of people calling and shouting at him. But <laughs> How many of y'all have tried the Divine Reserve Hunt? Isn't it like the most fun thing ever? <laughs> I, I schedule my work days around it. Aaron, plug your when they, when, they, when they come out, it's like, no meetings, I gotta go get my Divine Reserve and follow it on Twitter, so it's the best. But you know, honestly, that is one of the times where we do have some people that can't find it and they get mad about that, and so we have to, you know, have to address it. And I think do, addressing it publicly is one of the best ways to do it. Um, another thing that we did, one, the Brock talked about the pub crawls before, is that the ones that we announced on our newsletter were starting to get a little too big um, and the bars couldn't handle the, the size of the crowds that were coming in. So we started doing social media crawls, we call twit face pub crawls, and had no idea what the response was going to be. But it was a way in our newsletter to say, hey, we have something fun coming up and you're only going to be able to find out about it on the social media stuff. So. It was a way to get them to go to, to kind of add value. Um, and they've grown to 600 people or so just for the only announcing on social media, only telling them where we're going to be and not putting it in the newsletter. Um, and I, I think that's what you have to do is give people a reason to follow you. That's kind of what I me meant about the, uh, you know, the, the laundromat or whoever with the, the Facebook page. Why would somebody want to do that? If, if a business like that can think of a way to make it interesting and, and add value, then go for it. But um, we have to keep, you know, keep them entertained, so to speak, with new events. And one thing that people eat up on our social media stuff is anytime there's ever an, any new bottle art or news about an upcoming beer or even just say, hey, we're brewing Alyssa IPA today, which just kind of sounds innocuous, but then people get on and say, oh, that's my favorite and I love that and I'm going to go home and have one right now and we'll get, you know, 200 likes just from saying something like that. Now, um, I honestly haven't perfected or investigated the, the new way that Facebook's doing things, but it, it looks like to me the way they've done it could lessen the impact for businesses a little bit because it used to be in the regular feed anytime someone would like something or whatever it was in the regular feed, now they've kind of put it over to the side, which um, sort of makes me a little annoyed because that was one of the big benefits of saying something like that so people could see that we have a page. Other friends could see other friends have a page. So uh, I hope that has kind of corrected it, but it's just figuring out what people like to see, I think. Cool. Um, so I do want to leave a few minutes for questions, but we've got this last um, slide here about kind of looking back about what you guys know now and all of your wisdom from being in the industry. Um, something that you wish you might have known starting out, maybe for people that are starting out now, that you're like, man, if I'd have just done that a year before, two years, something like that, six months before, it would have really, really helped out. I didn't prepare for this one, all right, else I can't remember what I said. You can go last. Okay. Here, I think yours is on the next slide. <laughs> this is yours. Oh, that is. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that just I'm not. I'm sometimes I'm bewildered by how fast 
things change, you know, like growing that email list. I worked on it on the launch for the tasters for like probably a year and wrote it and had everything scheduled. And, you know, then I started getting a million emails from companies I'd signed up for and I stopped paying attention. You know, it's, I'm so fickle that way. Like I just get overstimulated by everything. So, um, I think that I just worry, you know, that like information emails change. Like we all used to be on Yahoo and Hotmail and now we're Gmail, you know, and it's like, how do I get five, 15,000 people to go change everything again, you know, in the taster deal? How do I get them to open that email? Um, it's like, I'm always kind of searching for like what the next platform is, but I'm not a tech girl. I'm an idea girl. I'm a messaging person, you know? And so, uh, I think just trying to stay, you know, like grasp it all and trying to stay ahead of it is just so hard. And I'm like going to classes here like every day (laughs) trying to figure this out too, because I don't always have the answers. I don't know the right people with them maybe sometimes, but um, I guess looking back, you know, I, I hate being late to the game and usually we're fine. Um, but I just wish some things, you know, lasted maybe a little bit longer. Um, but I should probably ask other people more questions too and figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have a great answer for this one. Um, you know, we we think about what we're doing at the company and, you know, 24 hours a day, which is all, why it's always really funny when a bunch of students want to do a project on the company and they think they're going to come in think about it for two hours and they're going to tell us how to run the business and we're going to be shocked by what they came up with um but uh really to me these are all tools and you're you need to be constantly analyzing what's out there and seeing what applies to you and make sure that nothing new is happening that is passing you by but um, I, I don't think any of these things are, are you know, magic bullets that, that fix everything. Ultimately, it's, it's kind of hard work and it's consistency. And I think the consistency is critical and you know, consistency of message, consist, consistency of personality. Um, that, uh, because that you're projecting your personality out there. And you just have to kind of keep at it and work hard. And if you do, you know, good things will come. Cool. All right. So these are just some examples of some stuff that these folks have done that we've been talking about. Um, we've got, I think it's one of the pub crawls for St. Arnold's up in the top left, the one pot cook off, which is one of like the most fun things to go to. Um, this is my lovely wife participating in the scavenger hunt, the photo scavenger hunt. Um, and then the, Tito's on the bottom, they uh, did a Tito's and Tony uh, tour where they went around Texas, and Tony is a world-renowned mixologist. Tito makes amazing hand, handmade vodka, and they both kind of talked about getting into the game and how, it, how they got started and their whole story, and people get to come together and drink with them and hang out. Um, and then the bottom is the Tito, what is the Tito Airstream? Yeah, we, our dream was to have an Airstream. Tito has several of his own, but we finally got one for the business. And fixed it up, and it we it's a hangout at festivals. It can be a bar. Uh, it was just a dream of ours, and now I think we're gonna like get a fleet someday. It worked out great. There are some really <laughs> fun pictures inside the van. Yeah. You get or inside the the trailer. You guys can go check those out. This is the outside picture. So that's it. Um, we do have a few minutes, so I think we have five six minutes. What kind of questions do we have, Mr. Copens? I can definitely take that one since it's something I've worked quite a bit on. Um, actually, I wouldn't say our laws are backwards because that would mean mean that we they're uh, that we're just uninformed and behind the times. Uh, what they are is they're extremely restrictive, and that's quite on purpose by the beer wholesalers who 
if her, I can't speak to the, the liquor laws, but the, for the beer laws, um, they have a legalized oligopoly and they like it. Please do not tweet that I said that, Morgan. Um, my distributors will get upset with me. But, uh, and it makes it very difficult. And social media has the ability to create some kind of some grassroots support and that should never be discounted. But if there is anything I have learned in this entire process is it, there are some real limits to how, much, how powerful that is. We think that we're all empowered, um, but I think w we live more in Syria than in Egypt. And ultimately, we get shot. And uh, the, the issue is, if we want to get the laws changed, we have to put our money where our mouth is and make donations to the politicians. I know that's not the way that it's supposed to work. That is how it works. That is the only way you can get the attention of these uh, politicians because the distributors, you can look it up and see how much money they're getting from distributors. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I think there's just huge potential for backfire and one of our policies is to always be positive. You know, we never want to start anything or have a public conversation that should probably be private and is probably highly political, involves so many different parties. So we kind of just stay out of the controversy and handle it from within quietly and keep the happy vibe going on the outside. Cool. Anyone else? I say the diehard fans would, but I mean, so many of them will never be on Twitter or have, I mean, I don't even think they'll have an app on an iPad. I mean, not all of them. Like, I think we just really want to be always as inclusive as we can be. And, you know, it's like Tito's is for everyone. A lot of companies go for 20 somethings, even younger than that. We, you know, it's actually a lot and never touch college age with marketing no matter how old people are but you know we I always said like you know one night I'd be in Houston at some old millionaire lady's house doing an event and the next day I was with the punk rockers on Red River it's like we just don't we we want to try and find that platform and you're right we might have to split it up you know it probably is pretty split right now but as far as like the reward program goes I do want to find a way to make sure everybody's on there you know it's it's just difficult when we've been relying on the email, you know, and maybe we make it less complicated, like he said, and just shorter and sweeter, you know, and hopefully, you know, we can say you can follow us on all these other ways, too, and maybe they'll just go to that, you know. I, I think one way you kind of uh, to address that is for us to make sure that we were adding social media to it, not you know, only doing that. So um, a lot of people that come on our tour don't care about Facebook or Twitter or even the email newsletter. So we have to make sure they have a positive uh, experience at our tour if they're just coming on the tour and that's their only connection to us because they're not going to see a tweet about whatever. So <clears throat> we can't stop doing tours or stop doing newsletters. Um, uh, you know, we have to include everything, um, and I think that's a, that's a big part of it. Cool. Well, that is all the time we have um, today, unfortunately. I'm sure there's probably more questions. There's some um, uh, Twitter handles, and I guess you can email brewery at St. Arnold's, and that's the place that Lenny will, will eventually get the emails. Um, you guys, your brands are amazing. I'm a huge fan, huge fan of you guys. Thank you so, so much for coming out today. Um, it was amazing. Let's hear it for the guys.